So when it comes to judging the quality of worm castings, a lot of people want to use a standard called NPK to figure out if their worm castings are any good. On today's episode of Coffee and Compost, we're going to go into why that's not the best idea. My name is Steve Churchill and I own the Urban Worm Company. So a lot of folks want to judge their worm castings as fertilizer or they consider their worm castings a substitute for fertilizer. So let's actually define what fertilizer actually is. And so we'll consult the Encyclopedia Britannica. And they say that a fertilizer is a natural or artificial substance containing the chemical elements that improve growth and productiveness of plants. So what are we talking about with these chemical elements? They are generally referring to macronutrients of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which make up NPK. So let's talk about what NPK really represents. Uh, NPK is a standard, it's called a guaranteed minimum analysis that is used for fertilizer. So if you go to your garden center, pick out any fertilizer, you're going to see an NPK value of something like it might be 10, 10, 10, or 25, 10, 10, or 5, 10, 5, or something like that. And what that means is a percentage by, by weight or by mass of that fertilizer. So if you have something that's say 25, 10, 10, that means it's 25% nitrogen, 10% uh, phosphorus, and 10% potassium. In this case, that makes up 45% of the, the mass of the bag. The rest of the 55% of the is made up of filler materials like sand, limestone, uh, maybe peat moss, soil, something else that is just a filler material to make up that 100%. Now, if you're in that same garden center and you look at a bag of worm castings, you are going to see an NPK value typically of 100 which tells you that's 1% nitrogen and either 0% or just trace amounts of phosphorus and potassium. But let's say you had worm castings uh, that you had tested and they, they had an NPK of 533. Is that really a number that you can depend on? I don't think so, and here's why. So worm castings have, or at least should have, a thriving population of microbes. We're talking about bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa, all that good stuff. These little living creatures in there are constantly consuming. They're consuming organic matter, they're consuming uh, nutrients, and so of those nutrients would be things like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So if you had your castings tested at say, uh, 5-3-3, meaning 5% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, and 3% potassium, those, uh, those elements, those macronutrients, are being cycled and they are being uh, consumed. So that number that you had was just a snapshot in time. What's really happening is that your NPK becomes a moving target because of those little animals that are constantly consuming uh, the goodies that are in your worm castings. As an analogy, let's just use a more human example. Uh, if I take 100 hungry people and put them into a room, uh, and in that room is a buffet of uh, crab legs, macaroni, and pie, uh, and let's say there's 25 pounds of crab legs, 10 pounds of macaroni, and 10 pounds of pie, you might say that that room has a CMP value of 25, 10, 10. But remember, we've got all those hungry people in there. So that they are gonna be consuming uh, the crab legs, macaroni, and pie. So our, our value is not going to remain 25, 10, 10 because of the people that are in there. Now I'm starting to veer a little bit outside of my lane here. I'm not a soil scientist and I'm really barely a gardener. Uh, so I asked a buddy of mine, Kevin Marini of the University of California to back me up on this and he, he pretty much agreed. He said that uh, what worm castings producers will do is they will dry their worm castings out to a point that's probably around 25% moisture level, which is going to either stop or just suspend the microbial activity in those worm castings. What that does is it allows them to offer a more stable NPK value uh, in their product. So this brings up two questions. Why even use NPK as a measure of quality with worm castings? And if NPK is not even a good measure of it, then what can we use to measure, to measure quality? So let's handle the first question first. Uh, the reason why somebody would list NPK on their worm castings is because it allows them to market their worm castings as a fertilizer. There are a lot of regulatory hurdles uh, before you can before you can market a fertilizer. That's why you see a lot of worm castings called soil amendments or soil conditioners because that's essentially an unregulated product. But once you start calling something a fertilizer, uh, there are a lot of hoops to jump through. 
but it also opens your product up to a bigger market. So the bigger producers are going to have a published NPK, typically again of 100, which, which allows them to sell themselves, uh, sell their product as, as a fertilizer. Let's get to the second question, which is if NPK is not really a good value, then what is, I'm sorry, if a good test of quality, then what is a good test of quality? And there are two tests that you would wanna get if you are really interested in learning this stuff. The first is just a standard compost test. And this is gonna be uh, available through your local extension office. Each state here in the United States anyway is going to have a land grant university that's probably going to have an extension office that is affiliated with a lab or has a lab that can analyze these things for you. You're gonna get things like your moisture level, your level of organic matter, your carbon to nitrogen ratio, uh, the, the amount of salts, uh, the amount of, you will get the amount of nitrogen, uh, and you may get some other things that you're looking for. You're, you'll get pH most likely. The other more expensive test that you can get but might be a deeper dive into your worm castings uh, is a biological assay. There are a few labs around here that do this. One of the ones that I've used before is Earthfort, and they're out in Oregon. You just ship them your worm castings. Uh, they're gonna put them uh, under a microscope and they're gonna tell you the amount of bacteria and the fungi and the bacterial to fungal ratio because you wanna know if your, your castings are bio, uh, bacterially dominant or fungally dominant. It's gonna measure ciliates, which are gonna tell you if your worm castings are or at least have been anaerobic in the past. Uh, you might also get the things that are in the standard compost test, like the pH, uh, but it's gonna be a much deeper dive into your worm castings and give you a, a really good snapshot of the microbial populations that are currently present. So those are two things that you might do. They're probably not, neither are necessary for the home gamer, um, <clears throat> but if you are really interested in tightly managing the biological profile or the nutrient profile, uh, in your uh, in your soil, as a lot of cannabis growers, uh, to be honest with you, do, then these are tests that that you are probably going to want to go ahead and get. And if you're considering buying these uh, buying worm castings from somebody, these are tests that a a, a worm uh, casting seller should be able to uh, provide to you. Guys, most people are making one of six different vermicomposting mistakes, and most of you, to be honest with you, are making more than one. So I put together a handy little guide that is gonna steer you clear of some vermicomposting landmines as you start or continue your vermicomposting journey. Just click this little card up here, it's gonna take you to my website, and you can sign up and get this guide immediately. I really think it's gonna help you. So until the next time, thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you soon.